So next, um, we have Mario Marquez. I'm going to let him do kind of his own introduction, but he is new to our Texas Sea Grant team. He is our oyster aquaculture specialist. Um, and I want to say he's up and running, but I think he's up and sprinting uh, with all of the oyster work that's been happening in Texas to try to catch up with the rest of the Gulf. So we wanted to give you a little update on what's going on here. Um, and so take it away, Mario. Hey guys. Um, yeah, so I'm the new <clears throat> oyster mariculture specialist in Texas. And the thing about it is that um, Texas is the last coastal state to actually um, allow um, oyster aquaculture or specifically in Texas mariculture in it. And um, Roz actually touched a little bit about it, but I'm going to go in further a little bit and uh, go into the details. So um, historically, um, we can see that the Gulf of Mexico has always been very plentiful in, in oysters, um, where the Gulf of Mexico, I mean, we, we can just produce oysters so quickly because of its high nutrients and warm temperatures. But unfortunately, that isn't always the case um, globally and in the Gulf of Mexico. According to the FAO, uh, there's been a global decline, uh, decline of oysters. And we're actually only, uh, we actually only have about 15% of the natural reefs globally. And that actually reflects um, in the Gulf of Mexico, there's been, there's been, you know, estimates and we're to 15 to 80% loss of historical levels in the Gulf of Mexico. And that's sometimes it's due to dredging and development, increased, decreased water quality, different changes in hydrology and the water flow. And um, a lot of companies um, throughout historically and, um, and so be it, um, they haven't been doing like what Ross's company has been doing where they're making sustainable. Um, so sometimes there's um, over harvesting and obviously we can have impacts like such thing as, as BP, we can get a lot of pollution and a disease that can actually kill oysters. But the thing is that um, you can see that there's been that decline um, in the lower slide in the lower uh, photo of the 1950s to 2010, but, you, but we still know that there are still some stable oyster populations that still exist. Therefore, is that the environment is still, is still well suited for oyster growth. Well, the tides are turning. Um, as we said earlier that um, last year, Texas um, passed a House Bill 1300 that allowed oyster aquaculture in Texas. And it's different from the wild because these are actually about 99%. Um, they're, they're basically, um, they're taken care of from, from hatchery to table. They're specifically raised, like Ross said, for human consumption. It really is a, it's, it's a niche. Um, it's a boutique oyster. They're cultivated from the farmer and they're maintained from babies to the harvest size. So they're actually, we get brood stock from a hatchery, I mean, from, from the wild areas, and they're selectively bred to give you the biggest, strongest, most disease resilient oysters you can have. And they're spawned in a hatchery. They're selected for health, disease, growth. And then they go out to the farm. And when the farmer gets them, um, you can see in that photo, that's about, I'd say about 2,000 oysters. They're smaller than the size of your pinky nail finger. Um, and the thing is that the oyster, I mean, the oyster farmer takes care of them, um, constantly maintaining them a couple times a week because um, they're controlling the growth rate and the fouling and everything like that to uh, emphasize quality. Um, and then it goes out to the consumer. So the consumer, this is a half shell oyster market. Um, they're looking for a premium oyster and it's a very valued niche, niche product. And um, for example, Roz is correct. Um, it, there's been a boom, especially in the Northeast and in the Gulf of Mexico to where oyster farming is the new, you could essentially say microbrewery um, to where it's all about the branding. Um, it's all about the story that you can tell about the, the way the oysters grown. And um, you can actually go out to the farm and talk to the farmer and um, see how it's grown. So how do they differ? Well, obviously they're, they're grown in cages. So that inhibits um, predation. Um, they're, they're not buried in the bottom 
um, so they will get suffocated um, with, within an, an anoxic conditions. So therefore, their mortality is higher. Uh, their mortality has been rated to about 20%. And you can essentially establish um, oysters or these farms in areas where oysters typically cannot survive because you can kind of control the salinity um, and you can put them in soft bottom. So it promotes faster growth um, because you're at a higher salinity. I mean, I'm sorry, at a higher, at a higher level of the water. Um, so it promotes more food. So they're essentially, uh, um, they're at a buffet 24 seven a day. Um, so the, oyster, the oystermen also can control fouling and they can improve, uh, they, they can improve the shape and appearance of the oyster make it very pretty, very clean and typically grow about 600,000 oysters per acre per year. So um, NOAA Fisheries, their highlight in 2017, they said that um, oyster aquaculture, they produced um, 36,000 pounds of oysters um, at an estimated value of $186 million just in 2017. And that oysters accounted for 46.8% for of this. Now, this is including the Gulf of, Gulf of Mexico, but not Texas. So Texas would not be into the, they would not, they would not be subjected to the 186. They would actually add to the $186 million um, in oyster aquaculture production. So that's a good thing for Texas because we are an oyster state. And they also, oysters actually do a really good uh, ecosystem service. Uh, there's a lot of environmental benefits. They're completely sustainable. And you've probably heard that a healthy adult oyster can produce about, can filter about 50 gallons of water a day. Well, if you're talking about an oyster farm that's growing about 200,000 oysters, um, they can filter about 15 uh, Olympic sized swimming pools per day. And that's just great. And that's, that's so beneficial for the Gulf of Mexico because you're mitigating um, nutrient uh, pollution, uh, nutrient runoff, and that can essentially reduce algal blooms and reduce dead zones that, um, that comes out from, uh, um, from ex excessive nitro nitrogen um, into the water. And another thing that's been seen is improving improved fishing grounds. So it actually improves the fishing grounds because there's more nutrients and it actually increases uh, structure in the area. And in, it, increases, and it also increases uh, seagrass growth. Um, one, of the, one of the good things about these oyster farms um, is that since they're very well protected and they spawn a couple times a year, um, they actually help uh, produce more oyster reefs, natural reefs, because it essentially when it spawns, it'll allow the oyster reefs to reseed. And it also creates a really good ecosystem service. For example, an 18, 18 acres in Alabama, the study was done in Alabama, their oyster farms provided about $30,000 in ecosystem services. Um, so Texas has just started on it. Um, we're still in the permitting processes, but hopefully we will start oystering early um, in 2021. Um, I'm here to help anyone that needs it from permitting to setting up your oyster lease to any questions and this is my contact information. Um, I'm located in Palacios, Texas, but uh, if you all need me, we can just zoom and that really kind of covers my talk. Great. Thank you, Mario. Appreciate it.